Like I said in the introduction, Mud Series 2 dropped most of the characters. Along with that, it dropped all the plots and suddenly gained magic. Literally. Series 1 was an offbeat kids drama comedy, and this is an epic of magic and time, of the complicated issue of good and evil, and how to put the most annoying American accent on screen. Only Miss Dudridge, the batty social worker, and Bill and Ruby Bailey return for this series. After their mother's reaction to the wild boy at the end of Series 1, I'm guessing she shot him. Instead of such well-loved characters as Russell Brand, playing himself, this guy, and this bitch, we have this crime against the concept of accents itself. We're watching this year's best film nominations, Neighbors, Home and Away, and of course, Snooker. Let's see if we can grab a word with one of the cinema's biggest stars, Sylvester Stallone. This guy is dim with a good heart. Two more incompetent criminals, and oh yes, a dyad of magical world-ending fury. Taken in broad strokes, this series' story could easily be refurbished as the rarest of things. A good, overarching Stephen Moffat Doctor Who plot. Anyway, before I get carried away, let's start with the intro, because it fucking rocks. It's like it did everything Series 1's did, but better. In a way, we open in a quiet living room, the tranquil location shooting soon interrupted by a drunken act who stumbled into the wrong set. Got to be here. At least the soundtrack sounds impressed. This is the Raggedy Man, aka the Old Man. In our hypothetical Stephen Moffat Who storyline, he'd be a new, unseen future incarnation of the Doctor. He's played by Trevor Peacock, who's taken this rare chance to really Gandalf the fuck out of a part. It is time for the battle. It is written. I command the five horsemen of Conigar to take arms and appear! Why don't you just try the sword and the lady in half instead? His son Daniel played one of the criminals in Series 1 and is still the primary screenwriter. It's a year on from Series 1 and Bill and Ruby are making preparations to go back to the camp, but fate, and a guy with a beard, will intervene to take them on a much stranger journey. Ruby's decided that she's too grown up to give a fuck about the unsung hero of Series 1, Steve the Teddy Bear. Ruby's not taking Steve! I'm getting grown up! Oh, you've got to take Steve, he'll miss you! You'll miss her, won't you, Stevie Weavy? Are you sure you want to get grown up? I'm thinking this is also why the wild boy's nowhere to be seen. She got bored after her mum shot him and left him in a zoo and no one fucking noticed. There you are, Steve, you go with Ruby. Out! <coughs> Miss Dodderidge is introduced coming from her granny's funeral in exactly the same way that she spent about 60% of her screen time last series. Singing nonsensically. And sing a happy song when the dog. How's the funeral, Miss Dudridge? Absolutely marvellous, thank you, Miss Venables. Granny Dudridge would have loved it if it hadn't been her own. Fun loving, was she? No one could ever be as wonderful as my Granny Dudridge. In fact, some of my happiest childhood years were spent. spent working out to the nearest octave what merry gibberish I'd spew out as she was lowered into the ground. Miss Dudridge has a new ward slash assistant in Dalston. Oh, you must be Dalston! He's illiterate, which means he already has more personality than some of the replaced main cast from series one. I'm too big for loads of stuff now. Too big for cartons, too big to call a lolly a lolly, too big Oi. to... I'm doing my learning. Someone as big as you should have learned everything by now. Now, you might wonder why he's going to a kid's holiday camp, and so do I. Let's hope they explain at some point. What's a second series without evolution? So on the journey to the campground, we get nonsensical singing and beatboxing. Belfond Heights, Belfond Heights, always makes me smile. Belfond Heights, Belfond Heights, we'll be there in a while. MC Dudridge! There's climbing, scrambling, hang gliding, boating, archery, abseiling, and runaway criminals, and a shitty Krypton factor, and so much drama, and almost being drowned. After showing Dolst and all the stuff that they didn't have the budget to show us in series one, we get a plot update. Felfon Hyatt Closet. Very good, Dalston. 
Fairfront Heights closed. Closed? Oh no, what are we going to have to do? Go in search of something more interesting than a week under Miss Palmer? The camp's about to be demolished with little or no warning. I'd say that's a tad unrealistic, but Miss Palmer's in charge. She probably got offered 50 quid and the chance to stab someone. Don't knock money. It has its uses. Elsewhere, our bumbling criminals for the series have got out of jail. They seem to be the same two after the Diamonds in Series 1, but both have been recast. Which is weird, considering the guys who played the originals wrote the show. Firing yourself once your part's been promoted to a main role is a powerful indictment against your confidence in your acting ability. I can't believe it, Vic. We're out! 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 <laughs> I think I'll just pop back in for a moment. What do we do now, Miss Dudderidge? Wait for a new plot to come along. A better plot with animal transformations, dramatic twists that make you question everything that came before, the end of the world, time travel, murder, resurrection, vengeance, prophecy, causality as we know it being destroyed, and an almost impossible love story or two. You know what? I believe you, Miss Dudderidge. Hagen could have chosen any series to review and she chose this. The chances of mad shit happening are probably quite high. Anyway, without the camp to go to and these three under her power, Miss Dudridge decides to do the probably illegal thing and take the trio to her dead grandmother's place for the week instead. And on the way, teach them some new words. So, can I say that word? Of course you can say that word. Great! Teet, 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 teet. Ruby, you know what you are? You're a teet, teet, teet. Ruby's a teet, teet, teet. Thank you, William. Come on, Miss Dudridge, it's just a bit of teet a teet. In Granny Dudridge's village, we meet the last two parts of the main cast. This crime against speech. This is without a doubt another great night in the sporting calendar. Let's hand it over now to our man on the spot, who I understand is talking live for the champ, Jerry. Wouldn't be quite so bad, but I'm pretty sure she was going for a Welsh accent. And Miss Dears, who's going to be our villain. Oh, I'm ever so busy, love. You can feel the rage boiling off her talcum powder. The girl with the accent is Ronnie. She was put by Callie Clark Sternberg, and she rather deservedly acted in very few thanks. But five years after this, she was part of a pop group that came 12th in Eurovision. A song that cloying and shit, I'm baffled it didn't win the landslide. Ronnie's thing is that she wants to be in the media and acts like she is, much to everyone else's chagrin. Kind of ironic given her lack of a later career, but what can you do? You can pity. I'm gonna call her the accent until she learns to stop doing that. Just shut up, will ya? Fighting talk, Lennox. Just really shut up. What's going on? Ah, uh, we're joined now by Frank Bruno. Tell me, Frank. Uh, come on, Bill, we've gotta go. As ever, Big Frank's not giving much away. Nah. It's a wonderful cottage. Very peaceful. Nothing for miles. Just uninterrupted silence. All the better to hear the sirens when the cops might track you down for kidnapping Miss Day. She has some powerful Gary Busey type energy going on. By the time they arrive at the cottage, about halfway through the episode, the old raggedy man, no not that one, has completely destroyed the place searching for something. Because you see, that was Miss Doddridge's granny's house. <laughs> But you have to love that he starts trying to tidy up hours worth of wreckage as soon as he saw the car approach. Oh, it hasn't changed in years. Granny was a bit of a slob. So, what are some kids, a confused looking skinhead and a completely rational woman to do while waiting for the potentially dangerous old man in the house to reveal himself? A heart to heart about growing up? I'm big now. I'll probably be wearing high heels soon and shaving. I'll probably have a really big beard soon. Ruby is the accidental gender queer icon we all deserve. In a way, nah, almost killing yourself in a kitchen. You okay, Bill? Bill? Save me, Stutteridge! Yo, biscuits! Inside the tin, Dalston, aka the guy with the name that somehow manages to be both less funny and more embarrassing than the guy in Genesis 7, finds a vintage copy of Vampire the Masquerade's 20th anniversary release complete with a leather binding. Not something much more important. Dairy. In a way, time for the terror to begin, not the discovery of the old man, but Bill finally noticing shit and realising that there's no TV. Do you hear? That is the sound of ultimate suffering. My heart made that sound when Ruben slaughtered my father. 
Naturally, Bill is not thrilled with this course of events. We're in the country now, Bill. We make our own entertainment. Like what? Bitching about not having any TV, probably. Anyway, I'm pretty sure the country got TV around the same time as the rest of the country. Anyway, Bill, there was no TV at the camp and you were pretty damn excited to spend a week there. Sure, there are less opportunities in this house to almost drown in a mud pit, but if you stop freaking out, I'm pretty sure you could work out a way to do it. Bill! Ah! Be well! I've just seen this strange old man. That's strange. The ominous warnings usually get delivered to the back door. Oh, he's probably a local tinker selling things. Beware, this offer will soon run out, so don't delay. Finally, having mastered his laundrette leaflet, Dalston's been using the diary to practice his reading. Suspicion. Suspicion. Secret. Secret. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Goodness, what are you reading? A horror story? Are you Granny's diary? Granny Doddridge's diary? Oh my goodness, this is awful. It is pretty bad, yeah. Sounds like a Dean Coons book. Taking advantage of Miss Dudridge, not giving that much for shit, Bill has slipped into the village to watch some TV. Now, I'm not sure if this counts as another crime on her part, neglect, or one less crime, because she's no longer technically kidnapping him. But there are worse things than kidnap. The glitz, the glamour, that is the Oscars. Not so. Let's see if we can grab a word with one of the cinema's biggest stars, Sylvester Stallone. Mr. Stallone, how do you feel about- Leave us alone, not so. You too. Ah, Sean Connery, as ever surrounded by a bevy of babes. Mr. Connery, mind if I have a word? Stop bothering customers. And my audience, and me. What's weird is that she can go in there, bother actual paying customers, and Bill, and all she gets is barely more than a tut. Stop bothering customers. But the second she also starts annoying the old man, who's warning Bill to seek out and protect the diary. Find and guard the diary. Then Bill and the old man get chucked out and she's left alone. All the old man did was bother people who weren't paying while she was actively trying to drive customers away. And magical storyline or not, I can't imagine it's great optics to kick a 12 year old and the strange man who's bothering much to the street together. Find and guard the diary! Leave him alone! Or the evil one will triumph! Not exactly sure what everyone ignoring this says about the village, but it says it pretty loudly and a bit theatrically. You know, I made a joke about Miss Dudridge not giving that much of a shit, but it's literally dusk and she's still reading from that fucking diary. At least she's not worked out that she's in a TV show and started talking to the camera operator. Closer, closer, closer. No, it's the Foley artist she's talking to. The gentle tap, tap, tap of the loose bedroom window. It's a simple scene. She reads and everything she mentions happens just off screen via sound effects. The hoot of the lonely barn owl. And then there was the sound of a chainsaw. And the mating frog seemed closer somehow. As they get closer and closer, soon they'll come crashing through the door. Nah, it's Bill rightly freaked out with the old man. Nutters! Everywhere! Though not worried that it might have just led the old guy to them. It's not a problem because he's already been there, but that's just one of many things that Bill doesn't know. Anyway, the diary was Granny Dudridge's, and it claims that she was murdered. Granny Dudridge's diary. It says Granny Dudridge was murdered. And I'm going to find out why and by whom. So she didn't write the identity of her killer in the book when she wrote in detail about how she was fucking murdered before hiding the diary. So it turns out that the first step to solving the mystery of her apparent murder is in the castle. It says the secret's in the castle. First thing in the morning, we'll go there. Not the police station informing the cops that she was murdered. I can understand that. It's hard to solve your granny's murder with your pet children if you're in jail for kidnapping them. Anyway, Bill brought Steve after all. He figured Ruby would need him. I don't get scared when I'm with Steve. Steve says, don't get scared, Ruby. And I don't wish I brought Steve. Steve! Good, glad that character growth is dealt with. In the morning, the two criminals are already planning their next genius job. Robbing the local castle and trying to work out their exact relationship. Can't we just go straight? No, we can't just go straight. They spent a lot of time in prison together. 
So the gang have arrived at the castle, fresh on the trail that Granny Dodridge blazed before she blazed her final trail and introduced death to the world of mud. We just followed the same trail Granny Dodridge did. Well, Granny Dodridge was mad. Yes, well, try not to emulate your heroes too much. So, who's inexplicably running the castle but the accent? Hi. No! It's the nutter! Her dad owns the place. This is why they can't physically eject her from the plot. Oh look, there's the old man. He's run out of people to ominously warn, so he started on the sky. Beware. I realize that so far you haven't seen why I love this so much, but if you stick around, you will. The plot is gonna get amazing. The kid actors are mostly good with the exception of the accent, but she improves as she does less of that crap. If you missed my intro, you might recognize Bill, that's baby Russell Tovey, who's been in a fuckload of stuff and Doctor Who. Dalston was played by a guy called Dickon Tolston, which gives me two thoughts. One, Dickon's a real name, and two, I think they invented Dalston's name by jamming his actors' names together and by squinting. I can't wait to see Russell Tovey play someone called Ruvy. Wait, Ruvy? Like, Ruby? Is this actually a thing? No. No, it's not. What a dumb idea. Anyway, watch out for episode two when shit starts to get real. The unexpected. Ow!